Ah, thank you again. I just, I continue to be so richly blessed by just our time to sing together. I love that. And I, and you know, I know that um, in many of our churches these days, we don't sing a lot of hymns. Our church, we try to sing some hymns and some new songs, and that's good, right? Um, but one of the things I've loved this week is that some of these songs I just haven't sung for a long time. And the blessing of that is that when I sing them, I pay really close attention to them. And I think about, like, I don't want to just sing these songs. I want to live these songs. So when we talk about trusting Jesus, and we want to obey him, I don't want to say that unless I will do that. And I want to live that way. Amen? Amen. And I think that actually, I imagine maybe that was planned, and I assume it was, that that fits really well with what we want to talk about tonight. Because as we've talked, we've talked about how can we work toward a healthy church in our own context. So I hope that all of you, each of you, is getting a, a hope and a vision for how you, you have responsibility and you have the ability to actually work toward health in your church, to pray toward health in your church, to encourage toward health in your church. All of you have the ability to do that. I hope that you are catching a vision for that. And as we've looked at these different things that we want to pray for a healthy church, we want to strive to have biblical theology and sound doctrine in our churches. We want to have loving commitment to one another in our churches. We want to have gospel accountability in our churches. All of these things are great and vital characteristics of a healthy church, but at some point, the church needs to make some concrete decisions, right? And, and I'm not saying none of those things are concrete. I'm just saying that there come times where you're thinking, all right, all these things are in place. Yes, good. Yep. Yep. Now, what do we do? <laughs> Maybe there's a big moment facing your church. I can think of when we do a membership class in our church and we talk about the history of our church, we talk about some of the vision that the church has had throughout its history. And the building that we now meet in right now was built in 1968. And it's really cool to read about some of the letters and some of the things that people were saying and doing during that time because what we could see there was that there was a vision for the future of the church and there was a plan and there was... But it, it occurs to me that here's the church facing a moment where we're running out of space. What should we do? That's a tricky question. And it's one that our church may be facing very soon today. Which is great, but also kind of terrifying. For me in our church, I kind of viewed, to be honest, I viewed COVID, there was a, a, a big silver lining to COVID. <laughs> and the big silver lining was, and this is very selfish of me, and I confess that up front, but the big silver lining was, I came onto our church's uh, staff, I came on as a pastor of our church, Easter Sunday of 2019. And so I began to preach and, and all this, and, and we were seeing some growth, and it was really good. And then um, in the late fall of 2019, we were having about the numbers where, you know, our, our people are starting to come and ask, well, Pastor Brian, are we going to do a second service? Are we going to, what are we going to do? Are we going to overflow and like all this stuff? And I'm just like, I'm not prepared to answer these questions. <laughs> and then March 2020 came and I didn't have to answer those questions. <laughs> Um, but here we are now, and we may have to. So, but that, that, that's one, right? But there are some major decisions. And, and if you're going to ask the question, what should we do? We're running out of space. Where do you go in your Bible to find the answer to that question? Now, I think there are some principles that you'd need to think through very deeply, biblically. But you're not going to find precisely the answer. Are you tracking? So how do we make these decisions then? How do we make decisions in the church? How do we know what is better or worse? How do we know whether the decisions that we are making today are going to lead us in the right direction or the wrong direction? Now, there are a few different ways that people answer those questions in the church today. One of the ways people answer that question is the church as a democracy. Okay, So this is the give the people what they want decision-making filter. Like, whatever the most amount of people want, that's what we do. 
And maybe sometimes that's not a bad way to go, but I don't think that's the way the church is actually supposed to function. Some churches function, uh, we talked about this a little bit, pragmatism. Do what we think will work the best. Now, of course, that requires us to define best, define work. <laughs> Some churches have kind of a bottom line mentality. Let's just make decisions, whatever decisions we need to make that will put the most butts in the seats and the biggest checks in the offering. I don't like that decision-making matrix. Anybody? So how do we? And I'll suggest this. The capacity to make right decisions, let's just call that wisdom. And the point today is we need wisdom in the church to make good decisions. We need wisdom for a healthy church. But, of course, we immediately run into a problem there. And the problem is that Every person has a tendency toward pride and arrogance. And so everybody has opinions on what they think we should do and what decisions we should make. And everybody thinks that they are wise. <laughs> and it makes me think of James chapter 3, verse 13, where he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Now, does anybody want to jump right up, put your hand up, say, I am. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? And right away, wisdom is difficult, isn't it? Because it's not seen in claiming to be wise, but in what? Good conduct. Good conduct done in meekness. So we know true wisdom does not point to itself and say, look at me. True wisdom does not point to itself and say, look how wise I am. True wisdom is demonstrated in humility, in good deeds, without the need to make sure everybody knows about it. But we all like to think we are wise, and nobody wants to admit that they are unwise or less wise. And I think if, I, if, my, if my gut is right, that I think sometimes there's a little bit of a generational conflict about this in the church. I think sometimes there's an assumption that other people that are, well, let me just go clear at it here, and you can tell me if I'm off on this. I think that there are some older people in the church that tend to assume that younger people are foolish and naive and thoughtless. And sometimes that's for good reason. But, but sometimes older folks in the church also tend to equate wisdom with age. As though those are the exact same thing. And then younger people, though, they see examples sometimes in the culture of older people who are quite foolish. And so then they resent that they're considered foolish and they think that they're being treated hypocritically. And sometimes for good reason. Do you agree with this? The decent assessment of the state of play? Golly, it's a tricky question. Who is wise and understanding among you? And if we're not careful, then we will fall into the trap the Corinthian church fell into. They were very concerned about being considered wise. When you read through the letter of Corinthians, you can read through it all in one sitting. And you can just tell these people are pitting themselves against one another, trying to compare who's the smartest, who's the most spiritual, who is the wisest. And Paul's saying to them, the cross has destroyed the wisdom of this age. They were concerned not with wisdom itself, but with comparing themselves to other people. They're concerned with their own status. They're concerned with their own perception, how they were viewed. And so it's this, for this reason, they rallied around these different celebrity leaders like Apollos or Peter or Paul. This tendency is within the heart of all of this. When I was a youth uh, pastor and I would take kids to camps, I'd play this game with them because I knew it would, just, it would just send kids crazy. I'd give them a riddle. I'd give them a riddle that would take them all week long to figure out. 
And it was kind of cruel on my part. I, again, I can just it's confession tonight. It's kind of cruel because I knew what would happen <laughs> is that some kids would figure it out earlier and then they would just delight in the fact that they knew something that the other kids didn't know. And it was like this social experiment. But that thing, that right there, that resides in all of us. We love to know things that other people don't know. Or we like to act like we know things that other people don't know. And this is at the heart of who's wise. But that tendency in us to assert ourselves and say, I'm no more than you. I am more spiritual than you. I am wiser than you are. That's not wisdom. So what is wisdom? Well, we're going to start way back in the Old Testament. I want to try to tackle, biblically speaking, what is wisdom? And how can we pray toward this in our church? How can we strive toward this ourselves in our own lives? And how can we see this in the leaders of our church and encourage them in it? So, Hebrew concept of wisdom. There are three words, kind of a group of words that describe wisdom in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, These three words, and we'll see how they all work together. I put them up here. The first one is chokmah. And this refers to skill. You might be surprised to see that there. Skill, understanding, wisdom. Second one, tebuna. And that refers to kind of intelligence or being able to figure something out. Knowledge, right? And then da'at. And that means knowledge or insight. So here, all three, all three of these words are used. One of the first places the Bible ever talks about wisdom is in Exodus chapter 35. So in verse 30, it says, Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God. And then here they are, with chokmah, with skill, with tebana, with intelligence, and with da'at, knowledge. And, and what is Bezalel's job? He makes stuff. <laughs> with all craftsmanship to devise Artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. So what is wisdom here? Wisdom is the capacity of Bezalel and then another guy, Aholiab. And, and it's their capacity to understand how things work and then to make something of it. So we might say it's like this. It's like applied understanding. Now how do they get there? How do you get to applied understanding? Say that you're a musician. How do you become an extraordinarily skilled musician? You practice. So what's involved in that? Time, effort, experience, right? So I think this is sometimes the misnomer. When we want to equate, and we say that age one-to-one -one is wisdom, that's not true. Because you can see people that are older, but still very foolish. But that doesn't mean that age has nothing to do with it. Why? Because wisdom is it's, it's applied effort. It's sustained effort over some length of time. So that time element, now the hope is, well, let me say this. Let's say that I own a guitar and it hangs up on my wall for 30 years and I never play it. Does that mean that I'm a skilled musician? <laughs> no, it does not. Because there's been no sustained effort over time. And in fact, I may have owned a guitar for a lot longer than some other person, some other very much younger person, but they have put in sustained effort for, say, five years, and they're probably a much more skilled player than I am. Do you see how that works? It's not that age has nothing to do with wisdom. It's just that it's not the whole thing by any stretch. It's sustained effort over time. This concept, these three words, it's, it's fascinating. This is also how God created the cosmos. So we go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord, by wisdom, hokmah, founded the earth. By understanding, tebana, he, under, he established the heavens. And by his knowledge, da'at, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down with dew. So God is seen, Yahweh is the one who ultimately understands how things work. And by his wisdom, by his skill, he created the entire universe. Now, if you take that concept of applied understanding and skill, and you apply it not to craftsmanship of gold and silver and 
fabrics and this kind of thing. But if you instead apply it to life, that's what we're talking about biblically. The question of wisdom is, how do I build a good life? What do I need to do that? I need understanding. I need sustained effort over time. Yes? Now, Bible says, true wisdom begins with what? The fear of the Lord. So Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So one sure sign of not wisdom is the person who despises instruction. So that person who can't hear anyone say anything to them. That person may claim to be very wise and understanding, but they are demonstrating. They despise instruction. And what does that mean? It means they're a fool. That's not wisdom. Wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now one of the things that I just cannot stand is when we water the concept of the fear of God down to respect. That is not the fear of Yahweh. It is not, it is respect, but like way more than respect. Okay, respect is like, hmm, how can I? Respect is like, I respect professional basketball players because they are skilled athletes, right? Cool. Who cares? Right? Who cares? Who's going to base their life around that? That's not, that's not the fear of God. The fear of the Lord, okay, Earlier today, my daughter, we went out and we were building sandcastle. And Gwenny, ooh, those are big waves, Dad. I'm like, you don't even know, Gwen. She's like, we could take our bucket over there and catch one. And I was like, no, we couldn't. <laughs> we take our bucket over there and they will catch us. Okay, and I grew up going to this camp enough that I know that there are rip tides out there. So guess what I don't do to the ocean? Respect it. I fear it. Why? Because it will suck my little daughter out in and swallow her. That's fear. Fear of the Lord. It's not respect. It's fear. It's standing. It's the recognition that I stand in the presence of one who is incomprehensibly greater than I am. Over whom I have zero control. In fact, fear is what you have of a good father. I tell my church sometimes there are two names that my daughter calls me. Daddy and Sir. Depending on the circumstance. Okay? And most of the time, the reality is most of the time it's Daddy. Most of the time we're playing, we're having a good time. And every now and again she pushes her sister down on the ground. And I bark at her. And in that moment I get her attention. Her eyes are on me. And I give her a command. And I say, yes, sir. And she's like, yes, sir. Because I don't want her to push her sister anymore. Okay, that's fear. Now, why is it fear? Is it because daddy's going to hurt her? Absolutely not. Never. But it's fear because this is a one-way street. That's the reality. A one-way street regarding, I have, I have responsibility in our house that she does not have. I have authority in our house that she does not have. I have weight on my shoulders that would crush her. And so she she does not boss me around. She does not control how we do things in our house. So sometimes she is reminded that, oh, hey, stand up, shoulders back, hands down, eyes up, pay attention. Yes, sir. Fear. Fear is when we stand before God and recognize that He is a good Father who loves us, but who we do not control. Fear is when we, in fact, we don't stand before God. We fall down on our face and we worship Him. Fear is when we say with Job. In Job 41, after God has led him on a whirlwind tour through all the cosmos, 
And he said, Job, you don't even know what you are asking. And what does Job say? He says, I had heard of you, but now I see you. And what? And I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's fear. Fear of the Lord is fouling down with Isaiah and saying, Woe is me, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. That's fear. Fear of the Lord is acknowledging with David and confessing and saying, I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. Against you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified with your words and blameless in your judgment. We do not respect God. We fear Him. Fear of the Lord is praying Moses' prayer. In Psalm 90, one of my favorite of all the Psalms, he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to the dust and say, Return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end with a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble and they are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your, and your wrath according to the fear of you? So what? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Moses' prayers that we would rightly understand the majesty and justice and greatness of God compared to our smallness and sinfulness so that we would fear him and get a heart of wisdom. So true wisdom. We need wisdom in our churches. Wisdom is not fear other people and give the people what they want. True wisdom in the church is not just try to figure it out and do what's right. Wisdom is not just try to get the most amount of checks and the biggest checks in our giving. True wisdom in the church is falling down on our face before the Lord in fear. That's wisdom. Now, praise God. All that's in the Old Testament, which means not that it is obsolete, but that it's incomplete. Because we are not left only with fear. Fear is meant to drive us to the gospel. Because wisdom is ultimately found in Jesus and demonstrated in obedience to him. Colossians chapter 1, we see this concept of wisdom come up again. Starting in verse 24, Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. To what? To make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, The hope of glory. So Paul's ministry, he says, his ministry is to make the mystery hidden for all ages known. And that mystery is Christ in you. And that is the hope of glory. Then he picks it up in verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with what? With all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Okay, him we proclaim. Him, not stuff, not ourselves, not good advice. Him, Jesus Christ, Him we proclaim. And we warn everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Okay, there, remember, biblical Christocentric theology. Who do we proclaim? Jesus, that's who. 
There's sound doctrine, gospel accountability. We are warning and teaching everyone. With what? With all wisdom. And then he says, so that. There's a purpose. Why are we working so hard? Why are we proclaiming Jesus, warning and teaching people in him? Why? So that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Verse 29, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Now look at this. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. You know those folks that come along and they've got something to say that just sounds like it. It just really sounds good. It's just not Jesus. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So Paul, Paul's purpose in teaching them, proclaiming Jesus Christ with all wisdom, warning and teaching, is so that he could present everybody as mature, so that they would not be deluded by nice-sounding stuff, that they would be strengthened against false teaching, false but sounds about right teaching, but still false and then he concludes verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith. Now those words, rooted, that's the beginning. Built up, that's when you're growing in Christ. Established, that's where you stand firm today. Rooted, the beginning, built up, you grew, stand firm. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So therefore, conclusion of all of this. As you receive Jesus, so what? So walk. Now that's not like literal walking. That's living. That's doing. That's acting. Walk in Him. So what does this all mean? It means that we must not mistake where wisdom comes from. Wisdom comes from fear of the Lord, and it comes from Jesus Christ. Wisdom, all of the wisdom that the church needs, once again, everything's about who? Jesus. It all comes back to Him. And so just because someone is older does not make them wise and mature. Just because someone is educated does not make them wise and mature. Just because someone is in a leadership position does not make them wise and mature. Now, none of these things are bad. Okay, None of these things are bad. It's just that we can't mistake any of them for the thing itself. Right? A person who has been faithfully following Jesus for a long time, for many years, my guess is, Y'all probably understand some things that I'm still working through. And that's a good thing in the church. But we're still not going to mistake that for the real thing itself. Are you with me? A person who's committed themselves to formal education in order to be equipped to serve the body of Christ, that's valuable to the church, yes? I hope so. I keep telling my church, I hope so. Because I just spent many years and a lot of money on a seminary education. And I think that's helpful to our church. But it's not the thing itself. That's not, education is not wisdom. In a leadership role, a person who's taken responsibility for others besides themselves likely has wrestled with things that you have not. Meaning in the church, your pastor sits in a very certain seat. And your pastor has to 
encounter situations that you ordinarily do not encounter. Your pastor has to wrestle through some things that you ordinarily do not have to wrestle with. And if he is a godly man, that means that he probably has gleaned some insight from those wrestlings and the fact that he has that role in your church. But even that, just because somebody has a leadership title, that doesn't mean they're wise. So what is wise? Wise is when we follow Jesus, sustained effort over time. And from him and in him, we learn to build a good life and we learn to build healthy churches. The one who fears the Lord, believes the gospel, and walks in obedience to Jesus, that's the person who is wise and mature in your church. We must insist in our churches, how are we going to view maturity in our church? Who is mature? Who are the spiritually mature people in the church? And we're going to have to insist, the spiritually mature people in the church are the people who are following Jesus. <laughs> the people who are walking in obedience to the risen Christ. That's who's mature. And if, they, if you have been doing that for a long time, praise God. If you're educated and that has helped you in your following of Jesus, praise God. If you're leading other people and you're following Jesus and you're shepherding his people, praise God. But end of the day, who's mature? Who is wise? And where is that found? The people who fear God, believe the gospel, and walk in obedience to Jesus. So I'll remind you back to a couple days ago. There was a man in my office who asked me why I would let theological concerns impact what decisions we make as a church. And, and this was an older gentleman. And that's an example of like, age does not guarantee anything. It's critical for our churches, if our churches are going to be healthy and moving in the right direction, that our churches need godly leaders and godly members who exercise true wisdom, who can instruct and admonish each other with biblical, godly insight. So how do we know if a decision in the church is wise or not? Should we ask what's going what's to put the most butts in the seats? No. Not so much. It's not bad. Like our church is growing right now and the Lord is adding to our number, folks, and that's a good thing. We're glad for that. But end of the day, that's not the bottom line. Should we make decisions based on what's going to increase our budget? No. We're grateful for the Lord's provision for our church financially. And we pray for Him to provide for our church financially. But that's not the rock bottom. So what is it? A couple of questions to help us wrestle in our churches with what is wise decision making. Number one, what most glorifies Christ and makes Him known? That's a good indicator of what's going to be the wisest course what leads the members of our church toward greater maturity in Christ? What is going to lead our people to walk in obedience to him more? What's actually going to lead our people to trust and obey? What teaches us to walk in Christ rooted and built up and established in him? What teaches us to be humble to be at peace with one another? What leads us toward commitment to one another? What leads us toward accountability to one another? What leads us to sound doctrine, right? These things that we wrestle with, this is how we know what's wise and what's not wise. So what should you do? What should we do? Well, number one, I think you can pray for godly, wise leaders 
who will courageously lead your church toward greater maturity in Christ. That's a regular prayer. You should be praying for your church. You should pray for your leaders that they would be godly, wise people who lead your church toward Jesus and toward maturity in Him, toward obedience to Him. And you should pray that the Lord will continue to raise up more leaders in your church who will be godly, wise people. You should honor the wisdom of the leaders you have who have demonstrated godly wisdom. You should pray for your own self that you would have greater wisdom in Christ as you seek to walk in obedience to him. That's a worthy prayer for any of us. And that's where we'll land. James chapter 1, verse 5. James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it'll be given to him. How do we know that God will generously give wisdom to all who ask? Well, he says so, yep. And even more than that, we know that God will give wisdom to all who will ask because he has given us his son in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. So let each of us seek him and find wisdom in him that we may know how to live, know how to walk, know how to pray for our churches. May we ask God to give us leaders and members in our churches who will do likewise. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us all the wisdom that we need to live well, to help our churches, to commit to one another, to love one another well. Help us to walk in obedience to your Son in all that he teaches. I pray for the pastors and elders and leaders of the churches represented here that you would grant them wisdom and insight and godliness and obedience to your Son as they seek to lead these churches. We pray that you would help us to rejoice in your Son and trust that all of the wisdom that we could ever possibly need is found in Him. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen.